Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me say how pleased and honored I am to be here in the Oxford Union, such an historic uh, society, and have the opportunity to discuss with so distinguished uh, participants an issue that is, of course, of great interest for Britain, but indeed for Europe and for the world. I am in a specific position because I'm not a native speaker of English. I come from Portugal. I'm a Portuguese and European. So what do I bring to a debate that will be decided by a referendum by the British people? Probably the fact that Portugal has with Britain the oldest alliance in the world since the 14th century could be a, an argument to allow me to say something about your great country. But I really believe that what is at stake is not only important for my country and for your country, but it is indeed decisive for the global geopolitical order. And that's why, while I could also discuss some issues about Britain and the possible consequences, I would prefer to put my argument in this broader issue, having in mind that certainly it is for the British people to decide, and this is the first point I want to make, because we are a union of free countries. No one, no country is here forced to be a member. Since the European community was created by the six original members, all the members of the European Union have negotiated, have approved, and they have ratified membership, including Britain, by a referendum. And so this is not the Soviet Union. It's the European Union. And this is why it is important to make the point that it's a free union of free countries. And I really want to underline that point. And uh, coming immediately after you, Jan, let me tell that your very participation is one of the best arguments for the European Union. I wish that Czech students can come to this country and not be discriminated. I really believe that it's important that European students all over Europe can enjoy freedom of movement. I believe it's a great progress of our civilization. All countries that are members of the European Union decided to be either by parliament procedure or by referendum. And there is a fundamental rule, the rule of unanimity. So a country to become a member has to be approved also by all the others. I fundamentally believe that UK is extremely important for Europe. Because with UK, Europe is more open, it's more democratic, it is more committed to reform, it is more free trade oriented. I really believe that the UK has brought a lot to our union. And in fact, the UK is one of the most important countries in the European Union, indeed in the world. Very old country, one of the oldest democracies, a great history, one of the biggest economies in Europe and in the world, a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, the home of the, British the English language that has become now the lingua franca. It is also London, the financial center of Europe and indeed one of the most important financial centers in the world. Your country also has a great diplomacy. I was foreign minister, I can testify to that. Probably one of the most efficient and competent diplomacies in the world. And it is indeed a country that has brought a lot to the European Union. So I have no doubt that with Britain, European Union is stronger than without Britain. And I want to make that point very clear. It's true that the European community existed before Britain joined and certainly will exist even if Britain leaves. But we are stronger with Britain, and if Britain would leave, it will certainly be seen as a defeat for Europe and for the European Union all over the world, from Washington to Beijing, from uh, uh, Moscow to New Delhi. But UK 
is not only a very important member of the European Union, the UK has brought a lot to the European Union. By the way, the very concept of integration. Winston Churchill, still during the Second World War, mentioned the project of the United States of Europe. And in his famous Zurich speech, he made the point about the integration of Europe. OK, we can discuss if he was thinking about Britain being a member or not. But the concept of European integration, one of the fathers of it already in the Hague Conference after the uh, Second World War, and indeed already during the Second World War, one of the fathers of the idea was a great British statesman called Winston Churchill. But not only that, the single market, or internal market as sometimes we call it, in fact, to a large extent was pushed by Britain, namely by Margaret Thatcher and by Lord Cookfield. You had such a great European Commission president as Roy Jenkins. Enlargement, the fact that today the Czech Republic and all Central East European countries are members of the European Union, that was very much a project of Margaret Thatcher. I remember well I was Deputy Foreign Minister at that time. There was a debate in Europe. Some countries did not want enlargement, but Britain was pushing the agenda of a more open uh, Europe. But more recently, I was already president of the commission, I can testify, without British support at that time, it was Tony Blair prime minister, we could not have the climate change action where Europe is leading. And now finally, Americans and Chinese are following our steps because we were the first in the world to call the attention for the existential threats to the very existence in the future of our planet. And British leadership in that matter was critically important. And even more recently, I have to say, the Cameron Clegg government was extremely effective in pushing the agenda for better regulation to try to avoid some problems we have at European level in terms of bureaucratic or technocratical legis uh, legislation making. So Britain has been at the center of the European Union even before Britain was a member in terms of concept. By the way, not only Britain, the United States of America. Let's not forget, because we think geopolitically, that after the end of the Second World War, the Americans could have followed another path. They could left, have left the European Union destroyed. But there was the vision of great statesmen, from the Marshall Plan to the creation of NATO, to the support of the creation of the European community. Jean Monnet himself, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, was in the United States, leading the armament program and he was supporting this integration. So indeed, I want to make it clear, the European Union is fundamentally important also from a geopolitical uh, point of view. And today in the world, and that is my most important argument, and now speaking with experience of someone that has led the European Commission 10 years, today in the world, the 21st century, your world, the world we are going to live in, Dimension, size, matters. Does anyone present here in this room believe that a country of 60 or 80 million people can discuss in equal footing the future of the world with a country with 1.3 or 1.5 billion people like China? Or even with the United States, our partners, that are still the biggest power in the world, but probably not be there forever in that position? China. India, or even Russia, that in defense terms is stronger than any European country. Does anyone believe here that Britain or Germany or France alone are in the same league? Ladies and gentlemen, we need this dimension, we need this scale. Because the world today needs this action at transnational level. From financial instability to climate change to fight international terrorism, we need the leverage that European Union gives, not to destroy, destroy, not to dilute our national identities, not because there is a secret plan to put an end to our countries. It's such a great history. Look, I was 10 years leading the European Commission. If there was a plan to destroy our national identities, I should have discovered it. <laughs> I see the European Union as a way 
of reinforcing the capacity of our countries to defend their values, to protect their interests. Because on our own, we can bring a lot, and I've told you, some of the most important things Britain brought to Europe, to the world, and to civilization. But we need, in the 21st century, more than that. Because, and there I have to disagree with you, my dear friend, what you said about trade is fundamentally wrong, from the first to the last word. <laughs> People, the countries outside, they want to negotiate with the European Union. Suddenly, Britain is an important country. But look what Americans said, including the trade representative, Mike Froman. He said, we will not have a trade agreement with Britain. That was the American position. That is the position of President Obama. Why? Because they've decided already, after now concluding TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that they are negotiating now with us the TTIP. I was... I'm proud to have launched negotiations with President Obama, with, also with Prime Minister Cameron, in the margins of uh, the G8 meeting some years ago in Northern Ireland. And we are negotiating with the United States, the TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, that if concluded will be the biggest ever trade agreement in the world, because in spite of all the pessimism, what I call the intellectual glamour of pessimism, where people are predicting the end of Europe, the European Union and the United States relation is by far the most important in economic terms, in trade and investment terms in the world. But the Americans want to discuss with Europe, not only with Britain. And that's something I would like to tell you and to ask you. Who is interested in Britain leaving the European Union? Not the United States of America. Not the major, points, not major powers in the world. I know one person who is interested your colleague, Vladimir Putin. Russia wants Europe divided. And it's not a surprise for me that Prime Minister Cameron recently, for the first time, he presented as an argument for Britain to remain national security of Britain. That's an important change. Until recently, the argument was mainly economic and trade. But in terms of national security, he said also to have a position like we had common sanctions against Russia, we need to be with the European Union. And now these terrorist attacks in Paris make it, is, make, a, make it even more clear that we need to be together. Terrorism is transnational. Terrorism, please. Uh, do you think that Britain, we should control who enters our borders? Yes. What happened was not because the European Union did not control, but because the governments of the member states did not control. We need a stronger control of our external borders. That so far, the control of borders is a national competence. The refugee policy is a national competence. I started my career in the government. I was 29 years old as Deputy Minister for Security. Let me tell you that without the cooperation of Portugal and France, Spain would not have beaten the terrorism of ETA. We need transnational cooperation against terrorism. It's a mistake to think that terrorists can be transnational and that we can do it only on our own, uh, let's say, parochial approach. To fight terrorism, we need, of course, the capacity of our countries to assure security, but to do it in a transnational basis. Because the terrorists, they know no borders. And this is why, also from a security point of view, we need a stronger Europe. But of course you cannot ask Europe. When I became president of the Commission, our external agency, the control of borders, Frontex, had 60 people, less than any police station in London. So we did not have the means. But of course now, I think there will be a greater awareness of the need to work together also in terms of security. And that's why I think the most important driver for European integration is globalization. In the 21st century, our countries, however important they may be, they cannot do it on their own. Sharing sovereignty, they can do it. Sharing sovereignty is a way not of losing power, but increasing power. One thing is the formal concept of sovereignty, and another thing is real influence and power. And let me tell you, based on my experience, when we meet in the G20, I mean, it's completely different. If you can speak as France or Germany or Britain because you are a member of the European Union or if you are isolated. That is something, by the way, that Chancellor Merkel has understood. 
because all over the world when they look at her, they don't look at only at the Chancellor of Germany, but a decisive force in Europe. So we need Britain at the center of Europe to defend the national interests of Britain, certainly, because we can love our countries and be European. There is a fundamental difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is to love what belongs to us. Nationalism is hate of others. I believe in a strong Britain, confident, self-confident, patriotic, as I am also patriotic and love my country. But I believe it is important to do it in the European context, trying to defend our interests and protect our values, because at the end, it's about values. And I had the privilege, together with my colleagues, to receive the Nobel Prize for Peace for the European Union. It is about values, as you rightly said. It is by the European integration economic terms. But the goal of the founding fathers of the European Union after the war was to build peace in this continent. And in fact, in the Western part, we were able to do it. And nobody thinks in terms of war among former enemies like France or Germany. So it is a great success. It is not perfect. But I believe, frankly, I support the motion that together, the European Union and Britain are not only better, they are stronger together. I thank you for your attention.